In this film, the application of a radial gutter splint is demonstrated. These are used to treat second and third metacarpal fractures that are non-displaced using a splint applied on the radial side of the arm. With metacarpal fractures, the affected digits should be examined for rotational deviation. This is done by asking the patient to make a fist and ensuring that the digits and the nails of the digits are all pointed towards the scaphoid. If rotation is present, Reduction or even surgery is indicated. Neurovascular examination of the hand should be performed, checking sensation and also capillary refill. Injuries to the hand may be accompanied by wrist or elbow injuries, and both these joints are examined to exclude injury. Fractures of the second metacarpal bone may be accompanied by fractures of the first metacarpal bone. Palpating the anatomical snuff box and eliciting tenderness raises the possibility of a fracture of the first metacarpal bone. If present, including the thumb in the splint should be considered. The following materials are required to apply a radial gutter splint. Three small stockinettes, each with a width of 2.5 cm. A stockinette with a width of 5 cm. Padding with a width of 7.5 cm. Plaster. For an average size adult, 8 to 10 layers should be sufficient. An elastic wrap with a width of 7.5 cm. And bandage scissors. Do note that the size of the materials used depends on the size of the patient. The three small stockinettes are placed over the third, fifth, and first digit in order to prevent blistering of the skin between the digits. The length of the stockinette to be applied over the forearm is now measured. The stockinette should be long enough to cover the entire forearm and include the entire hand. The orthopaedic cast technician now decides where the hole for the thumb should be made. And a small cut is made at that point. The rough size of the cut is now demonstrated. The stockinette is then rolled up and gently passed over the entire hand and entire forearm of the patient. Take note that any wrinkles in the stockinette are smoothed out, as wrinkles may cause skin irritation. The stockinette should cover the entire forearm as well as the hand. After placement of the stockinette, the wrist and metacarpophalangeal joints are placed in the intrinsic plus position. This position prevents excessive stiffness after removal of the splint. The wrist is placed in 20 to 30 degrees of extension, as now shown and the metacarpophalangeal joints of the second to fifth digits in 70 to 90 degrees of flexion, as shown. Next, the padding needs to be applied. Care should be taken to apply extra padding over the ulna prominence to avoid pressure complications. Too much padding should be avoided, as this may cause the splint to be too loose and be able to move over the arm, which may lead to scratches or blisters. The flat part of the roll should be applied onto the limb allowing for easy unrolling. The application is started at the wrist joint with two turns and then two turns distally over the digits to be included in the splint. Thereafter, one further turn is made around the wrist and then the padding is rolled into the first web space and then proximally along the forearm with each turn overlapping the preceding one by 50%, as shown here. Note how the stockinette is left longer than the padding proximally, allowing folding, and protecting the skin from sharp edges once the splint is applied. Distally, the same is demonstrated, leaving the fingertips exposed so they can be assessed. The stockinette over the thumb will also be folded, as demonstrated here. All stockinettes are folded only after application of the plaster. It is advised to check if there are no uncovered areas left. This should be avoided to limit the risk of thermal injury of the skin. A piece of padding is used to determine the length of plaster required for the splint, starting just distal to the fingertips and stopping two finger breadths proximal to the elbow joint. Once the length of plaster has been established, an approximation is then made of where to place the hole for the thumb. 
This is at the level of the first metacarpophalangeal joint, as demonstrated now. The orthopedic cast technician uses the fingers of one hand to note the point where the hole should be made. He uses the other hand to cut the hole using scissors. In this case, the hole is noted to be too small and is widened. With the final size being checked on the patient's thumb, as now shown. The hole should be wide enough so that the base of the first metacarpal bone is not covered and therefore avoiding pressure complications. This is also done to avoid too much pressure on the superficial branch of the radial nerve, which may cause tingling in the thumb. Water at room temperature is used to wet the plaster, as too hot water causes the plaster to harden too quickly. The plaster is folded in a corrugated fashion, as now shown, and then dipped in the water for a few seconds. Excess water is now squeezed from the plaster, and it is then applied over the radial side of the forearm. The plaster can be trimmed if it is too long, as is the case here. This is done distally as well as proximally at the elbow joint. Thereafter, the plaster is smoothened over the forearm to remove any wrinkles, with care taken to ensure no skin comes in contact with the plaster. The longer stockinette and padding are now folded over the plaster, creating smooth edges. Take note how this is done distally. The tips of each digit left exposed, allowing for assessment. Also note how the stockinette is folded back over the thumb. The plaster is then again smoothened to remove any wrinkles and to distribute the water evenly throughout it. Thereafter, the plaster is moulded in the intrinsic plus position. To avoid points of pressure, care is taken to use the flat parts of the hand rather than the fingertips. The orthopaedic cast technician places one thumb in the palm of the patient's hand, while the other thumb and fingers support the fracture from the dorsal side, as shown. Thus providing a one, two, three-point fixation of the fracture, which is required to adequately support it. The plaster is supported in this position as it hardens. Thereafter, the elastic wrap is applied to the limb in the same manner as the padding, with the flat part against the surface of the plaster, and rolled in the same manner as the padding was previously. Although application of the elastic wrap is done under tension, care is taken to not put too much tension on it, as this may compromise blood flow in the digits. The elastic wrap is applied to the entire length of the forearm, as shown. Now the plaster is moulded again in the intrinsic plus position, using three-point fixation. This is done until the plaster is sufficiently hardened. Following the application of the splint, it is important to check that there is at least two finger breadths distance between the plaster and the elbow joint to allow bending when it is placed in a triangular bandage. The fingertips are then examined to make sure they are in alignment. Capillary refill is reassessed and compared to the initial findings. The thumb is then examined to ensure it can freely rotate within the splint. A triangular bandage is used to immobilize the affected arm. The longer side is placed over the shoulder of the unaffected arm, and the other side is placed over the shoulder of the affected arm. A reef knot is used to secure the bandage. A safety pin is then used to close the open end of the bandage, with care taken to ensure the bandage supports the elbow. The application of the splint is now completed. Take note of the hand's elevated position in relation to the elbow. This prevents swelling of the hand and forearm. Be aware that a triangular bandage is preferred over a sling, as a sling carries the risk of causing pressure complications via indentations in the plaster.